I'm sorry that I'm here. I'm sorry that you're all here. And I'm sorry that it was something in me that caused all this to happen to begin with. They were really starting to focus on their own relationship and uh, kind of just rediscovering each other because they had, you know, worked so hard and uh, were kind of retiring. So they were kind of working on kind of like a little second honeymoon. I knew John as a very kind, compassionate neighbor who loved his dogs and loved his family. He was a well-respected and well-liked person in town. And I think a lot of people in the community appreciated all that he gave back to the community. I grew up in the same church where Mr. Lee and his wife attended church and his children. And he was just a, he was a very, uh, very calm man, you know, very serene, intelligent man that was very well respected by everybody. He told me that for Bobby's Christmas gift, he was going to drive her back and forth to Dallas so she could go to school at night and she wouldn't be alone. He was a typical kid, you know. I mean, he, he grew up right around in this, in this area, in this little neighborhood right here. I remember getting in trouble because whatever I did, he did. Whatever he did, I did. I remember my mother had a glass kitchen table, and we broke it. <laughs> I don't know how we broke it, but we broke the kitchen table. And then, for some reason, we thought if we went and got in the bed and got under the covers, they wouldn't find us. So that's what we did. He played baseball, you know, as a little bit of youngster. And I coached him, you know, helped coach him in the little league and all that type of stuff. Uh, and he, he just grew up normally. He was... Um, uh, president of his class, he was runner-up for most popular in his high school, he was a star athlete, he tutored other students. Everybody was somebody to him and he, he just got along with everybody. about 11 o'clock I heard some gunshots and I jumped out of bed. I just remember hearing, you know, one loud bang, didn't know what it was. There was uh, nobody out yet. It's pitch black. I don't even think that street light was on. Miss Ludig was just standing there, just wide as a ghost, not saying anything, just kind of just spinning circles pretty much. They had seen him and his wife driving and they decided they wanted to steal his car. So they followed that car all the way into the neighborhood and into the driveway and uh, at that point told him we wanted your car. And Mr. Ludig was, uh, you know, just 
stalled by the fact and sort of gave him up the keys. And Napoleon Beasley came up and uh, put the gun up next to his head and shot him point blank range. And then uh, tried to shoot at Mrs. Ludic, but she tried to roll out of the way and played like she was dead. You know, this pool of blood running away from his head. I went up there and started trying to talk to him. I felt of his pulse, he still had a pulse in his arm right here. The last thing that I heard that John said in his, uh, was no, you know, he didn't even have a chance. I don't blame my family. I don't blame my friends. I don't blame society. I can't blame a federal judge. I don't blame anyone else for being here but me. You know, I, I, I really can't tell you. I don't. I really don't know what what was going on in his head that that truly made this happen. I, I really can't tell you that because I don't know. Uh, I wish I did now. Uh, I'd be trying to pump whatever the information I had into every 17-year-old that I knew. I couldn't put myself in his shoes and, and think about, you know, assassinating some guy in his, par in, his, in his driveway for an old Mercedes and then trying to shoot his wife. No, oh, man. No no connection I'd say that you know that's all this guy was he is a three-minute ordeal but that's all like you know when it's that close to you that's all you can see somebody as you can't see somebody as anything else except that and I know there's other parts to him this community right in here where I live has been the black part of the town. Most of the blacks stay on this side and most of the whites stay on the other side. We were high school sweethearts. This coming year will be 33 years of marriage for us. I have three kids. Uh, Maria, she was born in 75, then also Napoleon, he was born in 76, and then uh, Jamal was born in 83. We have one steel plant that's here where I work at, and I'm a line supervisor, and I've been there for 34 years, you know, which, you know, being a supervisor up there is it's a pretty good honor. I think it's 14 supervisors, and only two of us are black. So, you know, that's, that's pretty honorable, pretty honorable. You know, my mother is the one and only black ever to work at Graveland State Bank. My father was the first black city councilman. Um, in high school, my mother was the first black cheerleader. You know, lots, lots of firsts. Because some of my friends were white, I was ridiculed. Because I dated white girls, I was ridiculed. Not by white people, black people. That peer pressure, where you're not black enough for the blacks, not white enough for the whites, and you're left alone. I didn't belong. Most of all, I wanted to be black. I always theorized that uh... Napoleon felt kind of torn apart, that, that, that here he is, a, a black kid, and most of, if not all of, uh, Napoleon's friends were, were white. He had a really hard time fitting in. He had, um, you know, the black friends that were friends when they could get out of him what he what they wanted you know he, he had to do a lot that was just my opinion but then he, he i think sometimes he felt more comfortable 
uh, with his white friends because it was the color wasn't as much of an issue. Yeah, he was a light-skinned African American kid, and in his town, uh, he 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 received a lot of contrary pressure uh, from darker-skinned African American kids who accused him of not being black enough. It's possible that, that uh, to Napoleon he had to prove himself to his black friends because, you know, we don't know what was being said to him, you know, out there on the streets and everywhere, whether or not they were calling him Uncle Tom or something like that to make him want to have to do things to prove to them that, they, that he was black. I believe every good act, every heinous thing is first conceived and thought. Once you plant that seed in your head of what you're going to do, the rest is going through the mechanics. When Cedric Coleman brought this crime to my attention, the details, and he asked, you down with that? I told him, yeah, I'm down. That's when it happened. Not the night of the murder, but when I said yes to it, because that was my time to say no. You had... Napoleon, who was considered a good kid. And then you had the Coleman brothers, who were kind of known as being troublemakers. You know, he was in a, in a formation process of figuring out who he was. And uh, he I, idolized uh, Cedric, for example, Coleman, because Cedric had been a great athlete. And uh, Napoleon was sort of filling his shoes. Uh, and Cedric went into dealing drugs, uh, and uh, you know I think part of Napoleon falling into that was Cedric's influence. And there was a side of Napoleon that a lot of people didn't know about. There was a side of it, you know, he out on the streets dealing cocaine and um, fascination with guns and you know, hardcore rap music and things like that. He fell to the pressures that were around him, you know, he fell into a, a hole, you know, and uh, he, he couldn't get out before tragedy happened. Guilt innocence was locked up. I mean, there's not a question about who the shooter was. There was very little question about any any relevant facts there at all. Uh, so the the trial was about punishment. Before I left, I called my wife and I told her to uh, call the Tyler and find a lawyer. And, you know, this lawyer he that we had got in touch with, she had got in touch with. He was a uh, just happened to be a, a part of the case, you know, the, working with the FBI. And uh, never will forget, you know, he told me that morning before they even arraigned him, they said he told me my son was going to be killed. And you can just see that it was something that they had preconceived, that they this is what they was going to do for that crime. And no matter which way the evidence was, somebody was going to die. I've destroyed enough lives. The biggest apology I can give is to change and show through my actions that I'm a changed person. To look in and beyond a person's mind and heart and look in their soul and seeing, you know, um, <laughs> what's the purpose or possibility of rehabilitation in this case. I didn't see uh, 
any concern on his part. Who's to say as to what would set him off to discard somebody else or off somebody else? The testimony that, that came in then from the Cohen brothers that was so harmful was they said that Napoleon had uh, been talking on the night of the offense about um, saying that he wondered what it would be like to kill somebody. And they said that after the offense occurred, he showed no remorse. They said after the offense occurred, uh, he threatened Donald Coleman, uh, you know, to keep his mouth shut or, or else. Um, they denied all that uh, subsequently. You know, when our investigator went to talk to them, they recanted it and they said, no, this is false. We had to take his gun away from him on the way back to Grapeland because he was crying and hysterical and we were afraid he was going to kill himself. Anybody that's, that's the slightest bit surprised about the Coleman brothers after they have participated with the authorities under oath in, a, in a, an investigation which leads to their friend getting the death penalty, once everything's been done to them that can possibly be done to them takes place, recanting, anyone that's surprised by that is not paying attention to what happens in these types of crimes. They had uh, a deal that was suppressed um, in, you know, with the prosecution that the prosecution wouldn't seek the death penalty against them in return for their testimony against Napoleon. They could see the handwriting on the wall they were headed for state capital murder trials at which there would be a death penalty if they didn't do something. And they were going to get the death penalty. I continue to struggle to reconcile my crime with who I've become. I used to want to be black. I moved away from being what's black to being what's human. I understand that certain things transcend race and gender. And those things are what I look at now in people. During uh, the jury selection process, it, it uh, appeared that the prosecution um, made choices that were based on race, and Napoleon ended up with an all-white jury with an uh, African-American alternate juror who never served. The defense would have you believe that what we did is we went down there and tried to get a jury of Klansmen, and that's and it's absolutely incorrect, and it's an insult to the people that take their time at $6 a day to weed through these life and death issues and make tough decisions. You want a jury panel that doesn't have biases. And I feel that's the panel of juries, uh, jury panel that we arrived with. I didn't see evidence of any type of bias one way or the other. From a, a black defendant's standpoint, looking over and looking at 12 white faces who are going to determine whether they stick a needle in you or not, that has to be unnerving. It's not necessarily illegal. But it, but it certainly could be unnerving. Our investigator went and talked to one juror who um, made a racist comment uh, in, while sending him away and telling him he was unwilling to talk to him. The, the comments of a defense investigator chasing some juror down at their house three years after they served on a panel is not compelling to me. The investigator walked up to the man's door and knocked on it. The guy opens the door. Uh, the investigator said what he was there for, uh, to talk to him about the case. And the juror uh, said, I don't want to talk to you. And as he's shutting the door, he said, quote, unquote, the nigger got what he deserved. I was 17 when I was incarcerated. I was 18 when I was tried. I was 18 when I got to death row. This was the father of a judge, um, a prominent member of the community. You know, uh, five or 10 years or, or life, that wasn't enough. And that's just the way our society is. If, if you kill someone that's you know, that has done a lot for the community or prestigious or whatever, you know, oh, that person, somebody's got to pay because we needed that person here. You know, they were, they were doing something. But then, you know, you kill a homeless person, it may make the news. If John Ludig would have been someone who was not the father of a federal judge and not a relatively well-known landowner in town, 
we would have viewed the case the exact same way, based on what the offender did and based on the offender characteristics. Deceased would have been, you know, Joe Blow, ordinary citizen, instead of you know, John Ludy, father of J. Michael Ludy, Circuit Court of Appeals judge. You know, there there very well could have been a chance that Napoleon Beasley would be doing a life sentence right now. Of course, you felt I felt some regret that that it didn't come in time for Napoleon. Of course, I felt that, but but I can't, I couldn't. You can't just you can't bring Napoleon back. But you just got to be happy for the ones that that it's a blessing to. Napoleon Beasley made a terrible mistake and choice, and it cost him his life of his own choosing. Mr. Lug, it cost him his life. He didn't have a choice in the matter. You know, obviously Napoleon was a was a, a, a victim of bad timing too. Um, you know, law as it exi exists right now, you know, Napoleon could not have gotten the death penalty. Did he have to pay for what he did? You know, sure. I'm not saying that, that Napoleon ought to be walking the street right now. But the death penalty ought to be reserved for the, as the ultimate punishment, the worst of the worst, so to speak. And uh, uh, you know, Napoleon didn't fit that criteria. And I think even though he was incarcerated, Jamal still tried to model himself after him. And that's definitely a compliment to Napoleon to how he carried himself. And I know it was hard for Jamal because of uh, you know, he, he at the when the very first that happened started happening. You know, he had the hope that you know he. Yeah, he didn't understand what was going on. I can remember him saying, "Napoleon gonna come home." He thought Napoleon gonna come home. I hope we can evolve around it, out of out of uh, this violent stuff, and hopefully, all our kids won't be doing committing these crimes like that. I want something positive to come out of this no matter what happens to me. As long as somebody is blessed by the experience. To me, that is important. And that is what I'm focused on. Mm -hmm.